So um, I'm here today um, with Cara Barnett, and uh, Cara is uh, an anesthetist uh, from the US. It was a nice surprise when I was at the um, USLCA this year, not too long ago, and we actually had, uh, she was presenting um, on breastfeeding and anesthetics. So I had, I lifted my hand to ask a question and um, our conversation started from there. And so I'd like to welcome you, Cara. And uh, you want to just you. give us a little bit of a, a bit of a background about uh, about yourself. Sure. Um, so I'm an, well, in the US, we say anesthesiologist. I know <laughs> other parts that say anesthetist. Um, so I uh, went to med school at WashU in St. Louis. I'm originally from New Jersey. I'm back in New Jersey. I work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I am the director of anesthesia services at one of our regional ambulatory sites in New Jersey. And my interest in lactation started in 2014 when I had my first son. And I just come off maternity leave and uh, we started a group that would uh, support our cancer patients who came in for procedures or surgeries with anesthesia who were lactating. So I came back from maternity leave, I was still pumping and I heard this group was starting and I was like, sign me up. You know, I didn't really have much education about it uh, as a resident or a medical student. So it was something that, you know, we kind of figured out as we went along. Yeah. And you've done some uh, pretty amazing work um, from that. And that was one of the things that you were presenting was um, different protocols that you've put in place. Um, and, you know, and so you've done some really great work. And I, um, myself and I am sure most other um, uh, you know, professionals working in the field of lactation greatly appreciate having Thank you. guidelines out there, and which is which is excellent. Um, so I, I have had a question like, what do you find? Well, I find it fascinating, and so I'm sure you find it fascinating as well, <laughs> how um, yeah. that so often um, in um, the medical field that breastfeeding is just not on the radar. Um, and yeah. when, you know, we know um, when people are having surgeries, we're going to have people in that range group that are very likely to um, uh, be lactating. And so I'm just wondering about your thoughts um, of, of that. Yeah, they really, when I graduated residency, I did anesthesia, uh, specifically anesthesia residency between 06 to 09. The only thing I remember was, um, you know, God forbid anything gets in the breast milk, we need to tell the patients to pump and discard for a day or two. So that's what I thought it was supposed to be up until like 2014, which is kind of sad. Um, it's gotten better, which is good. Um, the American Society of Anesthesiology has put out um, different, uh, the infographic they had in 2017 and the statement of resumption of breastfeeding in 2019. It's gotten better. I, I think that a lot of it has, we have this catch up that we have to do mm -hmm. with people who, um, you know, maybe my, even after my generation and before we have to keep educating them. And I think it's getting better. Uh, with more presentations and lectures and, and things at different conferences for uh, it's not just for anesthesia but pediatrics and um, you know lactation consultants and OB guys since they're also taking care of these patients and trying to play a bit of catch up but it, the good news is it's definitely gotten better yes um, I know that when we sat it started in 14 I don't feel like there was a lot out there I basically sat there with lactmed looking up medications mm -hmm. with another anesthesiologist and um, read some stuff on Kelly mom and found, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Hale and, you know, things like that. But I feel like, you know, we have a lot of catching up we have to do and hopefully it will continue to get better. Which, which is great. Um, if you had an opportunity to um, recommend um, uh, to, let's start with perhaps lactating parents um, that mm -hmm. know they're going to go undergo a surgery, um, what would you be encouraging them to be perhaps asking their, their doctors or the anesthetist um, in those situations? Um, so a few, few things is I would suggest first acting or just assuming that wherever you're going to go has nothing for you uh, because not all hospitals have 
pumps and refrigerators and everything. When we first started, we had nothing. And now we have, you know, breast milk refrigerators and things like that. So I would start with bringing everything, including your power cord. People mm -hmm. love to forget that just like mm -hmm. they forget their phone charger. <laughs> um, cooler with ice packs. Have, you know, try to come up with a plan ahead of time if you need someone to help support you, whether you're in the hospital or at home afterwards. I would speak to, you know, just let your pediatrician know mm -hmm. since that's your child's physician. I would let your whole surgical and anesthesia and nursing team know. Um, I will add the caveat that some people still incorrectly tell you to pump and discard. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, after a typical anesthetic, it, it is um, compatible or okay to use that breast milk or breastfeed um, mm -hmm. once you are awake and alert. And the yeah. reason why I say typical is sometimes we have these different types of procedures that use um, like chemotherapeutic agents mm -hmm. or things like that that aren't compatible. So that's why I say talk to everyone um, and just let them know. And hopefully you have um, an anesthesia team and a surgical team who will do everything they can to support you. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to think what else I would suggest. Um, I think a lot of it just has to do with, uh, educating yourself and knowing what would be best for you and your child for a, a child that's much younger or say premature and unhealthy. We're going to want you to be more conservative than say an older child. Mm -hmm. You want to, uh, maintain your schedule of pumping and or breastfeeding after your surgery, uh, surgery or procedure, uh, as much as you can close to your schedule, mm -hmm. because I think the biggest threat after anesthesia is uh, reducing your supply. Mm -hmm. So you really want to keep that supply and demand up, especially if you have a long procedure where um, you're going to miss a couple of feedings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen too many issues with mastitis or engorgement and things like that. Usually, I think it's the stress and just being calorie and probably a bit volume depleted yeah. Um, yeah that thing can really hit your supply so you want to do what you can to try to maintain your supply um and also um you know try to oh the other thing I wanted to um, suggest yeah. is whenever possible and not every anesthetic allows for it things like regional or nerve blocks things like yeah. epidurals spinals uh, nerve blocks. These are all things that allow us to numb up parts of your body, yeah. which allows us to decrease the amount of IV medications and pain medicines. Yeah. Those are really great. We can't do them for all surgeries, but no. if you have the type of surgery that allows for it, I encourage you to get it. Yeah. And that I makes that well. makes yeah that makes a lot of sense. Um, I love like diatribe. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I think sometimes um, we I know this is not talking about it on the um, side of the, the the parent, but even sometimes I think when a, a, a child or an infant um, undergoes an anesthetic and the and mm -hmm. the parent is breastfeeding, sometimes even in those situations they you know the medical professions forget that. Um, uh, you know, right. that baby's there. Just put them basically, you know, they don't have to be in that cot. They could actually be skin to skin on their parent. And if necessary, if they're up to looking to, to breastfeed, um, those, the infants are going to pretty well let them know. And if they do have a, a throw up, at least it's going to be much more easier for them to throw up on their parents. <laughs> <That's where>, right? <laughs> well, I remember those days, trust me, so true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, we're lucky with when we did our breast milk storage policy, we did it where um, we have a refrigerator for our patients in the surgical area and one for children who are breastfeeding their cancer patients yes. in their yeah. area. So I think that we have to remember that it could be either one yeah. when it comes to policies and things like that. Yeah, no, that that's excellent. Um, so um, let's think of uh, maybe some recommendations that you might want to share with colleagues so that could be um you know it could be other anesthesiologists or anesthetists whatever <laughs> we go here um uh, it could yeah. be um other families it could be family doctors it could be obstetricians it could be lactation consultants um so what would be some key points that you'd really want to be sharing um uh, with uh, the health professionals I think just um, knowing that, again, an, uh, anesthesia and 
uh, breast uh, feeding or lactation are very compatible. And we should make sure that we're informing our patients the correct information and also giving them resources. So if they have a question, they can look it up. There's a lot of good literature out there now for um, anesthesiologists and pediatricians and everyone else. So, you know, Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine has several protocols. I love 15, 28, and 35, I think, are the three that are most apropos. And we have a paper that we put out back in 2018 about our experience at MSK. So there's plenty of literature out there. Um, I would try to read it. And um, if anyone has any questions or, you know, I've done virtual talks for residents and um, peri anesthesia teams and anesthesia departments and things like that. I'm happy to do one virtually if you'd like. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think a lot of it just has to do with education, yeah. educating everyone around us, educating yeah. our patients, yeah. and also just giving our patients the support that they need, not just assume that saying pump and discard for a day or two yeah. is the best decision. It's, um, it's often not, yeah. not necessary. Yeah. Again, unless you get one of these very, you know, these um, not commonly used medications yes. intraoperatively. Yeah, that that has been so helpful. I really want to thank you for sharing um, uh, um, sharing with us today on this topic, well. as I think it's a really really important topic for um, you know both health professionals and uh, parents uh, to know about. So um, look, I will hopefully be able to get those uh, those documents. Um, and I think you said that the um, the uh, Academy of Wrestling Medicine's protocol is actually going to be updated probably in the next uh, yeah, number year or so. 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. we're supposed to, I'm going to be hoping with that, we're supposed to be updating that. But, um, you know, the one that's still there still has it's basically still, the, yeah, still exactly. has the same idea. Yeah, yeah. 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 So hopefully I'll, I'll be able to link those um, into the sure. chat below of the uh, the YouTube channel and we can get on um, and people can link to that as well. So again, yeah. thank you so much. And oh, you're welcome. Day. Thanks for having me. Take care. No worries. <laughs>